So good afternoon from Oxford, everyone. Now, good morning, good evening, depending on where you are in your part of the world. Welcome to panel three of the Oxford World English Symposium. Panel three is Dictionaries, World Englishes, and ELT. Thanks so much, Sean. And a hearty welcome from Cape Town in South Africa to uh, all of you joining in from all over the world. It's been tremendous to see on the Facebook group how diverse our audience is and also to see that so many of them are teachers. Um, so I think today's panel will definitely be very relevant to all of you, um, given that we're going to be talking about dictionaries, world Englishes, and ELT specifically. Um, Today, our panelists will all um, discuss uh, the apparent tension between the need to create dictionaries and other learning materials that recognize the diversity and pluricentricity of English, and the need to provide adequate instruction to English language learners who are under pressure to develop language skills and proficiency as defined by norms that are still largely based on this idea of standard English, a single standard English. And um, all our panelists will share some insights on how this tension can be resolved or at least ameliorated um, so that dictionaries can be more uh, responsive to the needs, interests, and experiences of diverse learners. Now, to introduce myself as a moderator, I am Dr. Philip Lowe, a publishing manager for dictionaries and dictionary data at AUP South Africa. Um, having initially come from a more academic background, I've now been working on commercial dictionaries at OUP for 17 years. In a sense, I've lived every academic's dream. Um, spending much of my studies building models of how school dictionaries could incorporate elements from ELT dictionaries to make them uh, more user-friendly, and then being able to move into the private sector to put those models into practice at OUP SA. In terms of world English, I think my most memorable moment at OUP um, came after I'd been on a morning TV show um, to talk about our work on including words from different South African languages that have become part of South African English. Now, on the drive home later that day from work, a street vendor tapped on my car's window. He didn't want to tell me anything, though, uh, but he just wanted to thank me for what OUP is doing and for, acknowledging, for us acknowledging the variety of English he speaks. Now that incident and similar engagements in classrooms have made me realize the immense need there is for people to have their variety of English recognized and the damage we can do in classrooms to children's confidence, self-esteem and learning ability if we don't. So from that, I will now ask our panelists to tell us a little bit more about themselves and their engagement with World English in the various fields. Hi, uh, can you hear me okay, please? Yes, we can hear you. All right, okay. Uh, I'm Dulmi Nujerata, a teacher of English, uh, working for the British Council Sri Lanka for nearly 10 years now. Uh, my work with the British Council involves teaching general English to young learners and IELTS and general English to adults. Uh, which are all global products at the moment. Before joining the British Council, um, I worked in two well-known international schools in Colombo, teaching academic uh, English and English literature for in international exams. Uh, I'm a former uh, Hornby scholar, which means uh, that I won a scholarship to do, a, uh, to, to do my master's in TESOL in the UK, which I completed in uh, 2021. Having completed my master's in TESOL at the Warwick University, I'm now looking uh, to work closely with local teachers to help them deliver more communicative lessons in their classrooms in, in Sri Lanka. The first phase of this project is uh, scheduled to start in the first week of May, uh, and then I will con continue to work with them by observing their lessons and giving feedback. Learner dictionaries have always been an integral part of our teaching, um, as we at the British Council strongly believe in learner autonomy in ELT. Thanks, Lauren. Um, Heath, I'm going to go to you next while we have you on a stable connection. Okay, so hopefully that, that connection stays stable. Can you hear me okay? Yes. yes. Great. So my name's Heath Rose, so I'm an Associate Professor of Applied Lingu Linguistics in the Department of Education at the University of Oxford. 
Um, one of my research specialisms is global English, global Englishes, which combines world Englishes with other uses of English associated with globalization, such as English as a lingua franca and teaching English as an international um, language. And so my interest in global English stemmed to authoring several books on the topic, including one called Introducing Global Englishes, published by Routledge. Uh, and I specialize in several regions, but most notably Japan, uh, where I worked and lived and taught for 11 years. Um, but also more recently, my research inter interests have spread to uh, China and Turkey. So I'm originally from Australia, but as I mentioned, I spent uh, 11 years living in Japan before mo moving to Europe uh, as a teacher. And so today I'll be talking from a dual perspective of me, both as a researcher of global Englishes, but also as a formal, former professional teacher of English. Thanks so much, Eve and Dorman, before you. Um, Shamira, tell us a little bit about yourself, please. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Sharvila Guha. I am going to keep my introduction really short because uh, uh, we want to discuss a lot more on the topic. Uh, I am the managing editor for OUP India Dictionaries. Uh, my area of uh, publishing is bilingual dictionaries. As we know, we have uh, a lot of uh, Indian languages which we work on and we publish uh, dictionaries in 12 Indian languages. Philip and I are uh, colleagues, so we have been talking about these things for a very long time, but uh, this is a good place where we can discuss our, uh, we can exchange our views on bilingualism and uh, world Englishes as, as we uh, want, as we go ahead on to the other topics. Thanks so much, Amila. Oh, okay, briefly, um, I, I was saying that um, I work as a language assessor with the British Council IELTS specifically, and then um, I have been in Beijing. I had been in Beijing for some months before the pandemic, but now back in Abuja. And then I also work part-time with the University of Abuja as um, a lecturer in phonetics, phonology. And um, before all of this, um, I've been teaching English language, been teaching the Cambridge curriculum at secondary school level for the past um, 20 years or thereabouts. So basically, English is what I've been doing all my life, teaching. And, and at this time, I'm also going into teacher training because my specialism at the University of Warwick was in teacher education. And, and someone mentioned Humby. Yes, um, I was also a Humby scholar in 2017, finished in 2018 at the University of Warwick. And that, that informs the thing I am doing right now because I got a post um, scholarship award to carry out capacity development for teachers in oral English teaching and assessment, which is um, basically what I am doing at the moment. Um, so if I am to go on to talk about my engagement with World Englishes, um, basically what I would say is that um, after my scholarship, I have been engaged with um, World Englishes at two levels. I've been doing lots of um, research advocacy and reform, and then basically engaging with institutions and educational practice. So as it is right now, as a result of my um, advocacy and reform um, um, initiatives, presently the Ministry of Education in Nigeria is seriously looking into bringing in a lot of reforms in English language teaching assessment in Nigeria. And then the examination body, the National Examination Council. I mean, as of yesterday, we had a meeting and um, what is going to happen is we're putting together a teacher training program. We're putting together classroom learning resources. And we're also bringing in digital practical language assessment because these are the missing links in what we are doing at the moment. And um, we're trying to shift away from the programs we had had before and then bringing in world Englishes, which of course is very much more pronounced at the spoken English level. So basically what we're trying to do is to see how we can move away from abstract theoretical learning and teaching of English language into 
practical communicative approaches that really puts into consideration what we have in world Englishes. So, so that's just um, what's happening in Nigeria at the moment. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thanks, Joanne. We'll, we'll certainly loop back to that later when we talk about um, teachers and their attitudes. But I think before we get there, the, the first issue that we need to address, um, and it should be addressed in any discussion about um, world English and dictionaries, is that inherent tension between descriptivism and prescriptivism in ERT dictionaries. So at OUP, we've certainly seen a very strong move towards a descriptive evidence-based approach, uh, approach to reflecting language in our dictionaries. So we've come a long way from um, Samuel Johnson's initial intent of fixing the language, that is, keeping it as it was at the time, not fixing it in the sense that he thought it was broken. Um, and by the way, even Dr. Johnson had to eventually admit defeat on that score. Um, English is unfixable. You, you cannot uh, keep it um, in, in one place. It keeps moving and growing. Um, but at the same time, uh, saying that and saying that we, we are becoming more descriptive in our dictionaries, even ELT ones, in ELT environments, dictionaries are still looked to as corrective tools alongside the receptive and productive uses. So how do we balance those forces? And what is the impact on the way that we treat world English in these dictionaries? Shamila, I'm going to give you the first bite at this apple and then bring in Heath after you. Thanks, Philip. So I'm going to talk about this and address this from a bilingual dictionary maker's perspective. And also as someone who comes from the English as second language market and not uh, uh, someone who's from the English as foreign language. Now, this connects to what uh, Joy was just talking about about that uh, language learning in terms of the markets that we represent, the continents that we represent. Uh, we need to take a communicative approach rather than a prescriptive approach because uh, we were, at India, the subcontinent particularly, was uh, a colony. And uh, that comes with a lot of baggage uh, when it comes to evolution of a language and the language that we speak now. Uh, uh, from a monolingual English dictionary perspective, it's understandable that you would keep something uh, prescriptive. But uh, from a bilingual perspective, and when, uh, especially for, uh, for the subcontinent where the divide is so uh, stark when it comes to uh, the political divide, as well as the economic divide uh, in terms of schooling, in terms of the education, the material that is available. We need to take a, a hard look at descriptive uh, the descriptive approach and how we can implement that in the classrooms. Um, the good thing about uh, the subcontinent now is that uh, the India um, education policy gives a policy level push where uh, the native tongue or uh, L1 can be used as the scaffolding where uh, that is used in the classroom as well as in other uh, areas to uh, use as a sca scaffolding to teach English and to increase proficiency. Uh, I would like to to um, uh, explain here a little bit more about the schooling system that we have. While we have a three language policy, we also have different kinds of schools. So we have public schools, we have governments, government aided schools, and the economic realities um, and the social realities in these conditions uh, in these schools are very different. So when it comes to language learning, the prescriptive method often leaves the child in the classroom uh, to be to feel very alienated because it's a context that they cannot often connect to, they cannot often understand. But when you use a descriptive approach, which um, for the subcontinent and the lexicographical history that we have, which is quite ancient, uh, fits in much better with the uh, you know uh, the proficiency that we are looking at. Uh, the Oxford dictionaries are, like you rightly said, Philip, uh, you moving towards the descriptive approach, but we have to be a little more cognizant about the nuances and the contexts that we are addressing in our dictionaries. Thanks, Shamila. Yeah, I think that's a that's a good cautionary note for all of us in the in the in the lexicographical sphere. Um, Heath, do you want to jump in here and maybe add from your perspective? Obviously, Japan. Um, China, a very different market. Um, I, th I think more, uh, or, or, or there's more scope for monolingual dictionaries like advanced learners dictionaries there. 
Yeah, so I can talk a little bit more from a research perspective and from that perspective, um, because I noticed one thing that you mentioned, Philip, was, you know, this, this sort of issue about whether dictionaries could be used as corrective tools to seek information, uh, you know, and, and in the classroom as kind of prescriptive or corrective tools. And I don't think there's necessarily an issue with dictionaries being used in that way as corrective or prescriptive tools to seek information about norms in a language. I think this is something that teachers find useful and students find useful. But I think perhaps what is important is that those norms in dictionaries are accurate reflections of how English is used around the world today. And so I think this is where a kind of descriptive approach to dictionary creation becomes really important. So long as you're drawing on the right sources of knowledge. So if we acknowledge that English is a global language used around the world, then the sources of knowledge about what English is and what you know, we, we consider the language to be, uh, we need to make sure that we're drawing on sources of knowledge or information about how English is used from diverse global contexts and not just say you know, how English is used in the UK or in America, uh, which is you know, traditionally what a lot of older dictionaries have done. Um, and so I think, therefore, um, uh, you know, for this kind of accurate um, reflection of how um, language is used, uh, we need to look beyond corpora that are, that are centered in, say, UK or American-centric sources of knowledge. Uh, we need to really view a difference between how we view errors and innovations. So often when new terms come up and are used in, say, popular media in America, uh, you know, they, they are being often quite quick to be added to the dictionaries as kind of innovative new uses of the language. But sometimes when we see innovative uses of the language come up in other circles of, you know, uh, English language use, um, you know, for example, in, in India, uh, they might be more quickly deemed as deviations or errors, mm -hmm. whereas the process of the creation is the same. The good news is that I think a lot of dictionaries today have really expanded their sources of knowledge, so they are uh, quite inclusive of different forms. And so I think it would just be necessary about pushing that boundary more with the, um, you know, the real knowledge that English is a global language. Uh, actually, more people speak it as a second or as an L2, whether it's a second foreign or additional language than first language speakers. So actually, these people, you know, are in the majority of English language users today. And the kind of language that is being used in these sectors needs to be reflected in dictionaries if they're going to be true representations of its use. Okay. Um, yes, I'm um, talking about um, attitudes. Basically, um, it's a kind of um, two generation of um, ELT practitioners in the Nigerian case. We have the more orthodox older practitioners, and then you have um, a more recent younger contemporary practitioners. And then um, naturally, the more older and orthodox teachers are more inclined towards um, a prescriptive approach to language while the younger ones are more inclined to a descriptive approach. And, and of course, some of the attitudes of the older teachers could be tied or explained um, as fear of the unknown, you know, you know, the change, and then outright laziness, obsession with the status quo. And, um, and basically, you, 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 you realize that a lot of people find it more convenient to stay in the prescriptive domain because there is there is hardly an, a, a chance of getting it wrong so if you want to become more creative and more innovative you know there is more chances of getting it wrong so they're going to tell you no this is how it's been and it has to be like that so the attitudes we have what we face is um, a kind of um, resistance you know to change and, and that's ironic because, you know, it's like trying to be more English than the English. So if the English is telling you, oh, do you know what, we, we, you can be liberal, we accept 
your context, we accept your realities. And here we are saying, no, 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 no. It has to be how it has always been. It has to be Queen's English. It has to be received pronunciation. It's, it's, it's a bit of an irony. That's, that's the, you know, that's the kind of attitudes we, ha we have. But the good thing is, for example, conversations like this are coming up and then, um, and for the fact that it is coming from the people we regard as authorities, I mean, Oxford is an authority if you're talking about English, Cambridge is an authority. And for the fact that they are coming up with initiatives like this, embracing dysentery, I mean, the, the dissentering of, of English language, embracing world English is, it's, it's encouraging. It's giving some of us, you know, it's kind of amplifying our voice. It's giving us, you know, more courage to press for the much needed reforms and changes. And the truth is that a lot of people are beginning to come on board. Because even the teachers, we are teaching children who can't learn the way we were taught. So the children themselves, our students, are realizing that some of the things we're doing actually does not um, um, resonate with them. So, so with that, it's, it's becoming more accepted. But, but then, like I said, we have the bigger institutions and the older people who I, I believe it takes more time to bring everybody on board to begin to embrace innovative changes and reforms and um, that is tilted towards world Englishes. Right, yeah. Um, thanks, Philip. Um, yes, actually, uh, the situation in Sri Lanka is also quite similar to um, what Joy explained just a while ago. Um, here, of course, the dictionaries are seen as correct, and therefore teachers tend to rely uh, a lot on dictionaries for not just for spelling and meaning, but also for grammar as well now. So, and, and, and I believe that in Sri Lanka, um, the, the reason for teachers to be uh, over reliant on dictionaries is because of lack of competence on their part. So there's, there's a lot to be done in teacher training, and there's a lot to be done in uh, curriculum reforms. So we are still at a very, very, very a basic stage in, in that respect, uh, which means teachers do have uh, teachers don't have uh, uh, like you know uh, any any authoritative work to refer to when it comes to uh, you know classroom teaching. Therefore, they tend to kind of uh, take a very prescriptive approach. So um, and and also there is this. Uh, aspect of parents, which uh, we haven't covered so far, I guess. You know, parents' attitude is such that um, the dictionary is the, the the right one, and therefore anything that is kind of innovative, like Joy said, creative, is seen as wrong. It's very difficult to change their attitudes, you know, um, because of uh, a lack of kind of, you know, awareness uh, among parents as well as uh, teachers. I see Shola saying that. Go for it. Yeah, so I just what I just wanted to add something to what Dalman was saying. Um, it's a little different here. We find a lot of suggestions coming from teachers at schools, uh, where they want uh, the you know local nuances, local contexts to be included in our dictionaries, and they look at us because we are uh, you know known for our dictionaries. So it, I think the situation in India is a little different, where uh, while one part in one in some schools teachers are looking at our dictionaries as you know the standard and this is going to be yeah. used at the correct use but at right. the same time because there are so many language movements language politics and we all have these uh, you know that i mean you would also know there are language issues and language politics uh, connected to our uh, continent so uh, we will face these things more going forward and uh, more and more voices seem to be coming from different regions different mm. uh, nuances are uh, you know pushed to be added to uh, our dictionaries and i think uh, i think one of the, of the i mean i agree that it's not going to happen uh, uh, overnight it's going to take time it's going to take time yeah. for people to accept it but i think as dictionary makers if we uh, are preemptive if we try and understand what the uh, you know the uh, dictionary consumers want what they are looking for and how the language is evolving because i don't think we are looking to fix the language uh, you know as in uh, or uh, students feel that you know what they are saying whether it's the received pronunciation or the native pronunciation is uh, wrong they don't want to be alienated but at the same time we have to understand that it will take time but we have to be preempt Thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Heath. 
Yeah, thank you so much. I just want to pick up that that point that Shamila was making about taking time, and then and then also uh, the other points that Joy and Dolman were making as well. That just to add very quickly, that uh, yeah, in a lot of the kind of global Englishes research that I've done in China and Japan, uh, as well as other that my colleagues have done, they've found that teacher attitudes are often seen to be quite a big barrier to change, and often this is because teachers position themselves as kind of gateways to knowledge about English about what. It's correct and incorrect and they see it as a service you know their kind of duty to pass on that knowledge to their students uh, and I think this is also a reflection that teachers have invested a lot of effort to master the language themselves you know that uh, most English language teachers I think it's about 80 percent of uh, English language teachers have learnt the language or use it as a second language so many of them have spent considerable effort to master what they see as a kind of correct form of English and so I think that kind of expectation then is passed on to their students. And I think that kind of deeply ingrained attitude, like Shamila said, uh, takes a lot to undo. And so some colleagues that I've been working on have been working in teacher education to try to change, you know, the, these sort of attitudes that teachers might have around correctness and language. But that's not an easy task, you know. Often teachers go through initial teacher education and then never return back to teacher education. And so it might take generations of teachers to kind of develop or be open to new ideas. That's very true. And of course, there are international exams to be prepared for and so on as well, um, uh, which I don't think is a problem we can solve um, in this discussion today. But it is something we as lexicographers and teachers, of course, need to bear in mind. Um, but let's then, for the sake of argument, um, accept that um, we do want World English content in our dictionaries. Um, obviously, a, a problem is that in many of our markets, um, we're still very much focused on print dictionaries. Yeah, so uh, like I was saying, this connects to what I have been saying right from the beginning, that uh, localization becomes very important, and I think um, one of the questions that has come in, particularly for, I think it, it was addressed to me, uh, about uh, OUPI India's approach to English language content and bilingual and the policy level push. So, uh, so I'll, I'll try and answer that question through this, but I'm, then Claire, I'll come back to that if it's still not answered. Uh, what happens typically in India is that because we have so many different uh, languages and of the 22 official languages, and each region has, uh, you know, a, a particular language and uh, states have official languages for that particular state. So what happens is when we are building our dictionaries in the bilingual space, we have to give a lot of attention to the local nuances, local contexts, local uh, senses of particular meanings. Uh, so much so that we do get a lot of complaints for uh, our uh, monolingual dictionaries where uh, a lot of um, Indian senses for certain words have been left out. Um, uh, and for example, let me give you a, let me give you an example. So the word colony. Uh, has very different meaning uh, in the English language. In the in America, it might have a very different meaning, and uh, you know the colonized countries uh, will have a very different meaning. Uh, you know, in biology, if you have the biology tag, it will have a very different meaning. But in South Asia, which the OED um, kind of tags of uh, in South Asia, the colony meaning could also be a society or a building society where, you know, many people have just, uh, you know, come together, built a particular uh, building and decided to stay in it. Uh, those senses uh, don't often appear in our monolingual dictionaries. When we are building the bilingual dictionaries, uh, we have to be uh, very careful of these things and we need to include those senses so our students have a context they can connect to, they can relate to, and they don't feel alienated. Uh, this is an approach which even CEFR is now trying to implement. Like when you like, uh, when you learn uh, European languages, CEFR always tells you to use European context and not to use a different language to learn. However, since 2018, they've taken a different approach. They are saying, okay, you can use local context, local uh, uh, understanding or local, uh, you know, something that is 
typical of that particular region to understand the meaning of the word or to use a communicative approach like Joy was talking about. So this is an approach that we take while building our bilingual dictionaries, but I think we need to do more. Uh, we will not achieve it uh, very soon. We will take time with revisions, with years, uh, with more feedback coming to us as and when we receive that feedback from the market, as and when we go to schools, go to different regions and understand what senses we are missing out, we will try and uh, include those in our dictionaries. But that, that, that really is important for classrooms in countries like India or, uh, you know, I'm sure in South Africa also because, Philip, we've discussed this in the past. Uh, there are words which are not in the English language which do not come up uh, in other regions but would be very specific to our context. Thanks very much, Armila, for that. Um, but if we then move on to uh, something that, that um, ties in a bit with, with the bilingual dictionary issue you, you raised. So um, in many of our classrooms, it will require more than just um, including world English, uh, you know, because in many of our areas, the languages we deal with are so different to English. So what role does um, translanguaging play in our classrooms, in your context? And what do we do as lexicographers? Uh, what do we need to understand? Uh, Dilman, can we ask you to start? Uh, now, uh, well, well, when it comes to translanguaging, actually, this is something that we are still experimenting with in Sri Lankan classrooms. As I explained before, um, our teacher training and, and also uh, curriculum design, they are all actually at a very, very basic stage in terms of world English at the moment. This means that the, the idea of uh, multilingualism, bilingualism, uh, and also many core concepts of social linguistics have not yet been properly taken into account in our curriculums. But uh, what we do as teachers, teachers who have been trained to kind of, you know, implement these things. Uh, one of the things is that, you know, we, when we teach vocabulary, uh, we allow our students to, uh, you know, use L1 if they need. And we are now kind of slowly uh, moving away from that kind of concept where your English books uh, should be, um, you know, used only, uh, you know, in, in the English, uh, in the English period with the English teacher and only English must be used and that that kind of that kind of uh, we have understood that it impedes our learners ability to learn new words so we are kind of moving away from that concept that prescriptive approach and we allow our students to use L1 if they want when we teach vocabulary also um, when our students do group and pair work um, they they can switch to uh, L1 if, if they uh, really want to uh, for instance, if they want to clarify something with, with their peers, they can do that, which was seen as a taboo uh, some time back. For instance, probably when we were uh, uh, learning uh, English as uh, uh, second language learners in school, uh, it was not seen as a very good thing. It was seen as something wrong. But as, the, as trained teachers now, we're kind of trying to uh, deviate from that concept, move away from that concept. Also, um, um, we... When it comes to words which have words and phrases and idioms, English idioms, uh, which have some connections with um, L1, um, uh, you know, resources, linguistic resources, we try to kind of show them a connection, uh, which was not kind of the practice that uh, we, we have had before, right, you know, and that kind of helps them understand, this method helps our learners understand uh, language is not kind of uh, an isolated uh, element, you know, language is like such a wide thing and then they can explore as they wish. So this idea of, uh, uh, you know, uh, target language and uh, L1 connection, sort of, you know, when we teach English is something that we are also trying to do. All of these things that I have told you uh, are elements that we are trying to uh, promote in Sri Lanka at the moment. I'm not suggesting that they are kind of very strongly um, taken into account in our, our curriculum. But as teacher trainers, we are trying to, kind of trying to promote these approaches and, and uh, methods in uh, language teaching. Thanks very much, Dilman. Uh, Yves, do you have anything to add to that before we go to Joy? 
So I just wanted to, yeah, just first work within definitions of translanguaging because it's sometimes used in different ways. So really there are two main ways that we use it. So in linguistics, it often refers to a view of language that aims to break down barriers and sees language uses and knowledge as more fluid. So in world Englishes, this could be relevant to break down barriers, not only between languages, but also varieties of English that might not actually be so distinct as the labels suggest. You know, that we are quick to suggest, you know, something is Indian English or Singaporean English, but actually it's quite diverse and fluid once we dig deeper and understand how it's used, that there are lots of shades of grey between, you know, that variety of English and other varieties of English. And so I think translanguaging therefore quite useful to not only break down barriers between languages, but also named varieties. Uh, and then the second use that's, uh, that I think we'll talk a lot about today is about in language education, where translanguaging is refers to practices where students are encouraged to use their knowledge of all languages they know to really enhance the language learning experience, and therefore breaking down barriers between languages in the classroom and not seeing second language status as a kind of deficit or disadvantage, but actually knowledge of other languages as advantageous in terms of the language learning environment. So obviously though, translanguaging poses challenges for dictionary creators uh, uh, in that uh, dictionaries are trying to have a record of a named language, you know, that's contained within the walls, you know, the pages of a dictionary that you want to contain something. Whereas translanguaging is about kind of breaking down those barriers. And I could see that when looking at bilingual dictionaries that might also be quite challenging as well because it wants to separate languages as in this is English you know and this is another language when in reality you know when you go out into the world, global world that English is used you find that those boundaries are much more blurred especially in multilingual contexts where it becomes less clear about whether this is an English word or a word in the L2 because the word in the L2 is easily adopted within that community in English. And so how can you not say then that it's not become an English word? Uh, that's just one example with vocabulary. And so I think translanguaging then, um, you know, kind of challenges the way that we see language in terms of what English, you know, what has become English and what is a borrowed word from another language. Uh, I think it, you know, that that's to become a lot more blurry. So I don't have the solutions here, but I can see how <laughs> translanguaging throws new challenges to creators of dictionaries. Um, Joy, do you have any solutions or, or more questions? In, in the Nigerian context, I, I think um, the government recognizes the role of translanguaging. Now, Nigeria practices what is described as a national language policy of adaptation. Now, this means that... Um, the mother tongue is the medium of instruction in the first three years. And then from the fourth year, English becomes the medium of instruction. And then the mother tongue becomes taught as a language. Now, I, I want to believe that um, translanguaging actually is at the foundation of the educational practice. Because you talk about um, going from the known to the unknown. That is the principle of education. So if a child comes to school, they are coming with their initial conceptualization patterns, which had been formed in their indigenous languages and contexts. So if I'm going to teach a child that this part of my body is called nose, I would have to tell them that this is Imi, that's, my, that's what it is called in my language. So I tell them, um, in English language, Imi is called nose. And that is the only way that child gets to know what nose is. I mean, so you discover that, you know, translanguaging, that is, and, and as a matter of fact, I might as well write that on the board or in their notebooks. So they have to, they have to put down their own ideas in their indigenous languages. And then I want to let them realize that, okay, in a different language, this is what these things are called. Now, by so doing, it becomes easier for the, for the learner to connect with these things. And what is happening is that we're actually um, getting to expand knowledge 
building on what a child already knows. Now, closely linked to this is the issue of bilingual dictionaries. Now, Africa has the highest level of illiteracy. And some scholars have argued that this is because Africa is the only continent where learners use a foreign language as a medium of instruction. So a lot of people drop out of schools because they are not able to cope, especially at higher levels of education. Now, if you had bilingual dictionaries, for example, now those dictionaries are not only going to contain definitions of adjectives and pronouns or what is a noun. They're going to have expression terminologies that talk about science, that talk about health, that talk about um, um, environment, they talk about all of those things. And if it is bilingual, then that means the users of the dictionaries have an understanding of what these things are. They have understanding of what their environment is mm -hmm. in their indigenous experiences and context. And now we are telling them what it is in English language. So you discover that bilingual dictionary is a kind of accelerated form of education because someone looks into it and it is easier for them to know about space travel and um, I mean, aeronautics because there is a description of it in their own um, in their own mother tongue and indigenous experiences. So I think that um, um, translanguaging and bilingual dictionaries is actually an acceleration of not only English language, because those dictionaries, like I said, are not going to be talking about grammar and rules of punctuations alone. They're also going to contain expressions in every field of human endeavor. And then the learner has an ability to connect with them from the view or from the point of view of their own indigenous word base. So, so I think this is the role that um, translanguaging will play, not only in ELT, but in education, especially on the African continent and um, in Nigeria, for example. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I'd like to echo that, Joy, and it segues quite nicely into our next topic on bilingual dictionaries. I mean, in, in South Africa, um, at age 10, kids are supposed to switch over from the mother tongue to English as a, as a language of instruction. But the pulse tests that are done at age 10 here shows that 78% of our children in South Africa can't read for meaning in the mother tongue. And yet somehow we expect them at that same time, at that point, to switch over to English as a medium of instruction when they haven't even mastered their own mother tongue. So for me, um, certainly our South African experience has been that um, bilingual dictionaries that help both with the acquisition of the mother tongue and then help with the translation into English and gives lots of contextual guidance and, and a lot of um, um, extra information. Those have become a crucial part of our offering um, to help smooth this path of uh, progressing from one language into the other. Um, but at the same time, we, we're still hampered by some teachers' attitudes that children should uh, start with a, with a monolingual dictionary straight away, and often a very complex one. Um, so there's that tension to manage as well. And I'm interested, Sharmila, um, to hear about in your context how you manage that tension, because I, I think you've already started raising the fact that there's more of a need for bilingual dictionaries in, in your market in India. Yes, yeah, so uh, we are already doing a lot. We are doing a lot in terms of bilingual content, uh, not just through dictionaries, but through our ELT content in the school space uh, and in the higher education space. We we want to address what Joy uh, just said that you know India has a policy level push where translanguaging is uh, encouraged because we understand that a child learns language. Uh, through context-based understanding or, you know, when, when a child uh, learns a language at home, they're not learning grammar first. They're learning how to say their name, uh, you know, to just say that they're hungry, thirsty, want to play, want to sleep. So those kind of things, it's context-based, it's situation-based. Uh, so why can't we translate that into the classroom? where uh, you know uh, smaller concepts can be explained in the home language this is now supported by the government policies this is now supported by our national education policy where, where there 
there is a push to encourage students to learn uh, in their home uh, language in the native tongue where the medium of instruction is uh, in, encouraged to be the home language uh, that way the child has um, you know less pressure on uh, themselves to uh, you know learn the uh, second language first and then try and understand the concepts just like Joy was saying that you know if you have a bilingual dictionary you know what your festival is uh, called or uh, you know what this color is so if uh, if you are looking at red you know lal is red so you are looking at the meaning and you understand what that is for a child it, it's important to understand that and to make that connection so when we are doing when we are building our uh, bilingual dictionaries, we are often careful of this. We want to include more local uh, uh, words where uh, the child will in the classroom understand what the context is and how that translates into English and then uh, use it in other subjects, just like you would do, you know, for maths or science, they would be able to now connect those to other languages and other subjects in other um, uh, classes. Uh, similarly, another thing that I want to bring up here is something that we are working on and we have been trying for a while um, is to include our experiences into the language. So, for example, there are, I mean, if, if you look at the subcontinent, there are uh, uh, different regions with different climatic conditions, uh, different weather conditions. Uh, you know, we, uh, that, uh, we are a tropical country, so there would be differences in our seasons than it would be, say, for a temperate zone uh, in the UK. Uh, we need to include those. We want to include those experiences in our dictionary. So maybe if uh, there is no monsoon uh, in a different country, but we do have a monsoon uh, here, we need to include that in our dictionary and the meaning in the native tongue so that the student can understand what different uh, you know uh, seasons there are what different festivals there are if there are different contexts that are not uh, relevant to the uh, european context but it is relevant here in the subcontinent we need to start putting those in our dictionaries we have started doing that in a large scale but uh, like I said, it's not going to happen overnight. We have to understand that it is a slow process. We will take our time, but this is something that we are addressing. Great. I'm conscious that we are rapidly running out of time, so I'm going to skip ahead um, and uh, Shamila and Joy direct one question to you and then give Dolman and, and um, he the chance to wrap up after that. My question, Shamila and Joy, to you is um, quite a thorny one. Uh, culturally sensitive terms and their treatment in school um, or learner's dictionaries. Can I ask you to say something in this regard? As I know you, you both have some good examples for us. So Shamila, maybe you to start and then Joy after you. Yes, so this is something that is very close to my heart, uh, the sensitivity index that we have in uh, our dictionaries and with language. Now, um, firstly, I would like to clarify that Oxford is very, very uh, careful in addressing the sensitivity parameters. And we are looking at the indices that, uh, you know, uh, that kind of affect the words that we use, the meanings, the senses that we use in our dictionaries and which then travel to the classrooms. Uh, Having said that, there are still terms in our dictionaries, there are still uh, senses in our dictionaries, which cause, uh, which often cause a lot of uproar in individual regions. Uh, and, you know, uh, given that uh, uh, there could be religious connotations, there could be uh, historical connotations, there could be uh, caste-based connotations connotations. They, they are quite thorny, as uh, Philip said. I'll just give you a small example here. Um, we all understand the word juggernaut, right? So when we use the word juggernaut, we uh, kind of think of something that is a spectacle, which is something forceful, powerful, and we don't often use it in the uh, in a positive uh, way. We often talk about uh, uh, the juggernaut bureau of bureaucracy, polit political juggernaut. It is something that just rolls on and uh, just crushes everything in its path. But if you look at dictionaries, very few of them, in fact, 
I mean, I don't, I, I don't think I have seen uh, any which actually gives you the history of the word. Uh, it is uh, uh, really, it's, it's a religious word for us because it's an anglicized name for the Hindu god Jagannath, which means Lord of the Universe. And Jagannath is a form of God Vishnu, which uh, who has a really massive temple in Puri, Orissa, uh, which is an important state in India. Uh, which has its own language. Now, uh, the, the, the most famous ritual that the Puri temple has is called the Rath Yatra, which literally translates to chariot ride or chariot procession. This is uh, something that, uh, you know, the, uh, the, uh, during the colonial era, the um, uh, British saw the spectacle, the huge ritual, the, you know, millions of people pulling the chariot. And it's, it's, it's a big festival for us. Uh, it's a religious issue for us. Uh, none of our dictionaries address the fact that it comes from the God, the name of the God. We only talk about it as a political issue or something that is uh, negative. I understand that the change happened when the, uh, you know, the missionaries, uh, the, uh, the, you know, especially the American missionaries, when they were looking at this and they took it out of context and they made it into a lowercase j and started talking about it as a, a regular common use word. But the fact that we don't have uh, the, any mention of the history of the word or the origin of the word causes a lot of issue for us as dictionary makers because there have been legal notices, there have been threats of legal notices uh, being issued against us as publishers by the temple committee because we have not given the history of the word or the origin of the word in our dictionaries. Now, these are issues which we need to, as dictionary makers or lexicographers, preempt. We need to understand that these are sensitive issues and uh, we need to address them before they become a problem. And we need, to, we need to address them not because they are threatening us with legal issues. We need to address them because it's wrong not to give the origin, mm -hmm. because we are kind of dismissing the origin or the dismissing or uh, the uh, the root of the word and i don't think that's correct uh, as uh, you know recorders of uh, the evolution of language we need to address this issue fascinating thanks Ramila. joy do you have any examples to share most Ni um, nigerian context for example there are some things that are regarded as taboo or disrespectful for example and um, if you were going to publish an ALT resource material, you don't want to show um, a picture of females or women watching a masquerade. Because what that would mean is that you are promoting something that is taboo. Because in some parts of Nigeria, women are not supposed to watch <laughs> some kinds of masquerades. But you see, to, to an average Englishman, it's, it's just fun. I mean, it's, it's, it's tourism. But then you, you couldn't do that. If you were going to give an illustration of people raising their hands in class, to an average Englishman, whether it was the left hand or the right hand that was raised, it wouldn't matter. But then if typically a child raises their left hand instead of their right hand, it is seen as disrespectful. You are not supposed to give people things with a left hand or receive things with a right hand in some typical, I mean, with your left hand. So if you were illustrating um, giving and receiving, and then you're using the left, you, I mean, you, you show a child using the left hand to connect things. I mean, it, it's going to be seen as offensive because you're going to, you are trying to teach the people what they shouldn't do. But then innocently, you were only actually just, um, giving illustrations. If you are going to teach prepositions, for example, and you want to tell someone that something is on top of another thing, you wouldn't use the illustration of someone sitting on a mortar. I mean, a mortar is just those wooden things you use for, you know, grinding. Because in our culture, you, you, it's, you, you don't sit on it. It's actually taboo in some, in some context. So, um, and and um, like Shamila was also trying to say, there are lots of um, religious connotations, you know, which is which, which are very close to people's hearts. Um, for example, you wouldn't want to include a, a picture of someone who was gay or lesbian because those things are considered taboo in some very very um, indigenous um, 
African or Nigerian context. And um, if there was a book like that, for example, I mean, that could cause, that could cause a riot. I mean, the village women could gather and said, okay, these white people, they have come to, to bring in something that is um, wrong or something that is bad. Whereas you were only just trying to teach English language. You're probably trying to teach pro um, vocabulary and pr um, pronunciation or preposition <laughs> as, 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 as it were. And um, teachers who work with local communities sometimes face this, th these challenges. And then um, usually there is a need to, to become more culturally aware of certain things, especially with people who have too much affinity with religions, traditions, cultures, norms, taboos, and um, those sort of things. Because all of those things are cultural and they are reflected or, or expressed through the medium of language. And this is the language we are dealing with in the class or in the ELT um, domain. You. I feel like we've covered a lot of ground here and, and as I said, some difficult issues uh, we've spoken about as well. But I do just want to, to give Tillman and, and Heath a last opportunity. Are there, are there any um, issues around World Englishes and dictionaries and um, especially World, world Englishes in classrooms in your specific experiences, uh, Dillman first and then Heath, that we haven't spoken about yet? Um, yeah, like uh, even uh, before I pointed out the fact that it's, it's in, here in Sri Lanka, the, the, the challenge that we as teachers face is the attitudes parents and some teacher educators have towards uh, world Englishers in the classroom. I told you still um, uh, SE standard English is sort of uh, what English teachers in Sri Lanka are expected to teach and also um, and, and, and also uh, sadly enough uh, minister of minister of education uh, has a very strong attitude uh, towards um, standard british english uh, being kind of you know the right thing to be taught and that therefore curriculum reforms towards world englishers uh, is sort of a long way actually compared to india uh, we are not very much advanced in that respect uh, but there are some uh, sort of uh, developments now uh, we have a dictionary of Sri Lankan uh, English, which was published in 2007, with uh, about 2,500 uh, Sri Lankan English words uh, being explained quite well uh, in the dictionary, written by Michael Mailer. And that's kind of, I consider that kind of the, uh, that was kind of the first step towards uh, promoting um, World English, I mean, Sri Lankan English in, in the ELT classroom in Sri Lanka. So I believe that the uh, Ministry of Education in our country should uh, take into account the fact that there are some resources being published starting from this uh, dictionary of uh, Sri Lankan English that could still be incorporated into teaching in, uh, in the uh, classroom. But uh, there's a lot of work to be done in that respect, I, I strongly believe. So. Um, Overall, my idea is that in Sri Lanka, the main challenge is the attitudes of parents and teacher educators, some teacher educators, and uh, the uh, Ministry of Education itself, that uh, you know, they don't kind of still recognize the existence of Sri Lankan English, uh, where we are allowed to kind of, uh, you know, uh, teach our students to think like that in an open uh, way. Uh, so on a final note about the bilingual dictionaries, I need to add something about that. We do have uh, bilingual dictionaries published locally as well. Uh, I'm not too sure whether Oxford uh, University Press has considered uh, publishing a bilingual dictionary, which is bilingual in terms of uh, Sinhala, uh, English, English, English Sinhala. Uh, actually, I don't think there is one at the moment. But therefore, therefore there is there isn't, this there strong... Isn't. That isn't yet. So there is a strong tendency towards monolingual dictionaries. And I do need to give, uh, acknowledge this, that I have been using the uh, Advanced Learners Dictionary, Oxford Advanced Learners Dictionary, which is exclusively uh, designed for South Asia uh, as a resource. Um, I have not so far come across anything that is culturally sensitive in Sri Lanka that's sort of uh, likely to create um, a controversy 
in, in uh, the, in this field. So I need to kind of acknowledge that uh, it, it's such a good resource, even, even though we don't have bilingual dictionaries published by the OUP, um, the, the monolingual dictionary that has been published for this region is such a good resource for us, and that's, that's something that we really appreciate as well. Yeah, that's that's a good punt for localization of dictionaries. I think it's it's definitely a golden thread that, that I see running through this talk. Um, Heath, anything from your side? Any last thoughts you want to add? Yeah, so maybe just some last thoughts are about the kind of barriers or resistance to change. So I like that Joy brought up materials because I think a kind of lack of suitable materials is, you know, we've talked a lot about dictionaries, but there's also other ELT materials that we rely on for teaching. And if they're still kind of pushing this notion of a standard English and, and English as part of the, you know, a kind of UK or American centric world, which is often embedded in a lot of that kind of hidden curriculum, especially in those cultural messages, then we, we're only, you know, we can't fully kind of confront the, you know, the kind of new ways of teaching or incorporating world Englishes in the classroom. So I think a lack of materials is a real barrier. Uh, Philip, you mentioned testing. I would agree. I think, you know, standardized tests are also a barrier to change. And then maybe the other one uh, would be this notion of standard language ideology. And so I think a lot of the panelists work in quite multilingual uh, countries. Uh, so I think a lot of people in multilingual communities are aware of different different languages and the value of multilingual knowledge. A lot of my work has come from Japan, which is a predominantly monolingual culture where the kind of notion of a standard language ideology is deeply ingrained in society in that there's a standard Japanese language. And often when we have these kind of national standards that exist in other languages, uh, that kind of notion about that there's one standard form of language can seep into beliefs about English and other languages that people are learning. And so I think in those situations also there's, you know, we, we, we might be more likely to encounter uh, resistance to to new ideas or notions uh, that might push the boundaries of whether it's monolingualism or translanguaging or notions of you know uh, you know that there isn't one correct form of English. Thank you very much, Heath. I think one thing that that stood out for me is how precariously balanced the world of ELT is between. Uh, progressive and conservative people, between parents and teachers, between lexicographers and policy makers. Um, it's been a fascinating and wild ride with, with a few bumps along the way from a technical aspect. I hope you all forgive us, the audience at home, um, the joys of, of bringing people together from uh, various parts of the world. Um, but now we, we will we have the opportunity to to um, give you a forum, all of you at, at home, and address some of the questions that you've asked. And I'm going to, uh, given that we, we're short on time, dive straight in. Um, the first one that's showing up on my screen is for Sharmila. Um, it's from Claire saying, Sharmila, I'm interested in OUP India's approach uh, to its English language content in bilinguals. Is there a policy about whether to use Indian Englishes or standard Englishes for these, or is it market dependent? So I think while I was addressing the um, uh, the question um, on uh, you know using bilingual content in and localizing our dictionaries in the classroom, I think I may have addressed this, but I'll come back to it um, specifically because she asks about the market. So uh, Claire, this is a completely market dependent. Like I said, that we have different languages for different regions and we have to be careful about what um, English we are using because there are uh, several regional uh, nuances that creep into each um, creep into English when we are speaking or writing the language uh, in that particular region. So we have to be careful about that. Uh, um, a quick example here. Uh, we have uh, a bilingual dictionary, the English English Telugu dictionary. Now, Telugu, Telugu is a language that is spoken by uh, uh, people of two states in India, Telangana and Andhra Pradesh. Uh, there are caste-based movements uh, that have that are, that have been ongoing in those two states for decades now. Uh, 
so much so that there are terms uh, in the Telugu language which have now become part of the English language. Uh, these are loan words which uh, have creeped into the English language and they are now part of the English language. Now, we at OUP India have taken a decision to include some of those into our dictionary, so in our dictionary, so that uh, students or learners of the language uh, in those two states understand that context and feel included, because that is a very important part of language politics as well as uh, identity politics uh, when it comes to uh, those two states. And uh, the language has evolved. The, those words have made their way into the English language. So uh, this is one approach that we are taking. And of course, it is market dependent. I hope that answers that question. Thanks very much. Um, then there's a question from Julie Moore asking, beyond localized dictionaries, which can really focus on specific Englishes, what role do you think world Englishes can play in global learners' dictionaries? And I'm, I'm really glad you asked this, Julie. I'll, I'll take this one. Um, what we've recently done at OUP uh, is that our ELT division uh, that makes the the um, advanced Oxford Advanced Learners Dictionary um, has collaborated with all the different branches um, within OUP to um, be more inclusive and bring in some of that content that we have published in our localized dictionaries and bring it into the Oxford Advanced Learners Dictionary. And so we find that the, the recently published 10th edition of the Oxford Advanced Learners Dictionary is one of the most inclusive uh, learners dictionaries around, I would say. So it has definitely been a focus area of our ELT division. And I also applaud them from, for having the courage to, um, you know, go to different branches, listen to people, in, include the, the entries they have to and also be aware of the cultural sensitivities that, that people like Sharmila and, and Joy have been speaking about. I hope that answers the question. Is there anything, a question from um, Valentin? I, I hope I'm uh, pronouncing the name right. Um, how can we teach a word representing a certain sociocultural norm in the L2 that does not have an equivalent in the student's L1 repertoire? As an English teacher, I have often been at the crossroads of teaching a word concept only contextually and have not been assisted by a dictionary. How can language practitioners meet these needs and challenges? Um, from, a, from a bilingual perspective, a dictionary perspective, I can just say that we do have something called the surrogate equivalence, where instead of offering a one word um, translation equivalent, we would um, uh, offer a, a definition and a usage note to explain that this will, word is in a way untranslatable and that the the, the, be, the best way to then treat that word in um, in the text that you you've come across it but I'm I'm interested to hear if beside this issue of surrogate equivalency there are any techniques or um, ways around it that you have found uh, anyone on the panel who wants to, to talk a bit about these um, linguistic gaps, if we can call it that. Um, uh, okay. Um, I, I, I could talk a bit about that. I mean, when you, when you look at Bloom's taxonomy, you, you discover that contrast and comparison comes at a high level. So if, for example, someone is trying to um, teach a concept that does not exist in an indigenous context, that alone is a resource because there has to be something contrary or that is something in contrast to what you're trying to teach. So if, for example, let's say a child doesn't understand the concept of hot, it doesn't exist in their, in their realities, but then they understand cold. So you can use cold as a reality to teach the contrast. So if you let the child realize that this thing which you have, this thing which you know is actually in contrast to something else, that gives them a bit of an idea because in this case, you are engaging their imagination, you're engaging their creativity. So in, 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 in spite of the fact that that thing does not exist in their repertoire and in their reality, but then there is a contrary notion or a contrary concept 
So you build on that contrary concept and try to connect it with what you're trying to get them to understand. And um, hopefully it's even a higher level of pedagogy and cognition because the child is now trying to figure out what could be the contrast or what could be the, the reverse of this thing which I know or this thing which I do. And um, well, if, if, if I think I also saw another question someone was asking, um, should um, bilingualism be used in every non-English speaking context? Um, closely related to this, I, I'm going to say, based on the principle of moving from the known to the unknown, I would say yes. Now, I haven't taught English in other contexts apart from the Nigerian context, but then if someone anywhere in the world knows anything at all in their context, I, I, I think that knowledge, that risk, that, 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 um, that information is a good platform on which to bring second language acquisition. So I, I, I think it will work in every context because you are using what the person already knows to introduce them or to bring them into what they don't know or what you target for them to know. Thanks, Joy. Um, what you were saying a little bit earlier made me think of something we, uh, I heard about a long time ago where in, in some cultures where it's very, very cold, especially way up, up north, uh, missionaries had to translate the, the Christian idea of hell, not as a very hot place with lots of fire, but as a frozen landscape that you can't escape from. And, and uh, I, I, I think that this idea of, of using um, explanations that are culturally appropriate is, is, is very salient and, and a point well made. Thank you, Joy. Anyone else want to add anything to that or can we move on to the next question? Uh, I can I can add something, Philip. Go ahead, Dean. Yeah, so I mean, I, you know, this kind of issue of not having um, the same, not having the vocabulary in the L1 when teaching the L2 uh, has, has kind of extended into other realms that it's not only a socio-cultural or cultural differences now uh, in another area that I work in a lot, which is the English medium instruction. Um, where, uh, you know, e English medium instruction has been quite common in post-colonial contexts, mm. but is becoming even more common in contexts where there was no British colonial presence. And so what's happening is English is seeping more and more into academia and into education. And what this, what, what we've seen as a downside of this is as um, disciplines have developed. So if you think of disciplines like engineering or mathematics or physics, you know, as they've developed and we need new terminology and words to, to uh, attach to new discoveries and ideas and disciplines, and it's not only the sciences, it's also the social sciences, mm -hmm. um, that English words are being attached to these concepts, but there are often no local equivalents that are often being, um, you know, created. And so this has been at least at those kind of in an academic English sense has become a huge challenge where there are whole disciplines where a lot of the vocabulary only exists in English and there aren't local equivalents to, you know, to, to be listed in ad advanced dictionaries. And so, you know, this is often referred to as domain loss in the local language. And it's something that I think we're gonna see more of in the future if English continues to, you know, you know, be used as medium of instruction in schools and universities. It's it's very interesting um, on that point that you know in 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 some countries, for example, in in South Africa, where we have officially recognised languages and bodies that look after them, there's actually been some government-sponsored um, initiatives to to ameliorate that domain loss. So, for example, you would have the National Language Body for Isizulu coming together and workshopping um, every term or, or, you know, every every semester to, to come up with some uh, new created terms for those uh, specific, specific words. But, I, uh, you know, other than, than government um, investment in that area or initiatives driven by, by publishers, it's it's... It's hard to see an organic solution to that kind of domain loss developing. Would you agree with that? 
I, I would agree with that. And I think, you know, while some governments have been quite um, you know, active in, in trying to create terminologies. This goes back to this whole descriptivism issue that if people don't use it, then where does it lead to? You know, mm. uh, you know, it's okay for organizations to create it, but if they continue using these words, you know, in the target language of English, because that's what's being used in the discipline, then, you know, I, I sometimes I'm a little bit skeptical about how effective uh, these sort of policies are but i recognize each country is very very different in mm-hmm. terms of how, how you know the kind of process of integrating and kind of spreading these new usage uses great thanks i have i have one um i think well this is the last question we'll take but it's just such a fascinating question that i do want to slip it in um it's a question from rajiv saying um in case time permits while constructing bidirectional dictionary is a common problem lexicographers face is determining the lemma form of the lexical items when it is an oral language, which is without existing literature, despite being quite a major language of the region. So um, how, do we, how do we get around that? Um, I, I do know that especially in Africa, there, there are quite a lot of initiatives where, where people... Um, actually have to go out to the villages with recorders and do quite a lot of field work and then transcribe um, the discussions. Um, and in, in the talk on Aboriginal Australian English yesterday, there was the, 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 the notion of yarning where people sit around the table, someone records them and then, then transcribes um, what they say. Um, you know, other than those kind of community-based initiatives and finding a way of of bringing those into dictionaries, um, is there any other way, uh, this issue of oral traditions and and, um, making sure those are represented in dictionaries can be addressed? Any thoughts from the panel? Well, I I think um, the, the, the one way this can be approached is through... Yeah, I, 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 I think engagements with local communities, engagements with um, um, rural areas, and then um, engagements with classroom interactions, you know, I, I, and that's why I'm actually very passionate about um, oral English, because this whole world English thing is more pronounced in the domain of spoken um, spoken English. So observing people in their natural environments, in the marketplaces, on the school playgrounds, in you know the places where the, 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 there is there is no threat, non-threatening environments. So getting what happens in these environments, and then if they are kind of um, collated, collected, and then codified. I think it produces or it gives a very rich resource. Um, And if this is um, recognized, it gives the people a sense of belonging or, I mean, they they, they end up owning this English and they are proud of it. And in a sense, that's also growing the language because in such situations, you come across things you never knew existed Because, of course, those are not realities that can be associated with your own environment or with your own experiences. So engagement with local communities in non-threatening situations and environments, I think is a way to get to know all of this and get a good um, source of data for whatever reason, for lexicography, for compilation and for dictionary um, productions and expansions, yes. Great. Um, Shamila, I'm going to give you the last word before we close. Yeah, so just just to add to what Joy was saying and this, I just wanted to answer Heath here. Um, I think he was talking about, you know, I, I was not very sure and is a little skeptical about how much the government policies and the initiatives help. Uh, but speaking from a very India perspective and connecting to what Joy was saying, uh, these are areas where the government initiatives really come into come in handy, where uh, there is a policy level push to pres- pres- uh, for preservation and promotion of languages. And this, uh, I will try to answer Rajiv's uh, first question when he's talking about bilingual dictionaries and uh, in rural areas where teachers uh, you know uh, don't have 
uh, access to these materials and how how can they uh, you know teach the students when they are facing faced with such situations. This is where government policies and initiatives come in very handy when we try and promote these materials, try and promote uh, uh, these kind of programs where the outreach is such that every child, even in the remotest part, gets access to these materials that are available in the market freely. Uh, in India, particularly, OUP has uh, a lot, many bilingual dictionaries in many languages, in 12 languages. Uh, we do know that there are, it is a very unique market where uh, local dictionary makers do a lot of good work in, uh, you know, bilingual, in the bilingual space. So it's not, a, uh, it's not a question of availability, it's a question of how much it's reaching the uh, different parts of the country, uh, the rural areas or the remote areas. And that's where uh, I think the state level uh, push can come in handy. Thanks very much. I, th I think that's a very good place to leave it. It reminds me of one of the campaigns we ran in South Africa, which we called Every Child Deserves a Dictionary. And I think that's perhaps a good, uh, a good place to, to leave this panel. Thank you all for your time. Thank you to the audience, um, but thank you in, in particular to the presenters for, for sharing your expertise with us. Um, have a lovely day and enjoy the last session, the last panel soon to follow. Bye-bye. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you.